And then the last way that's most common is um, like a physical description. So people who are like blonde, who were blonde back in the days, like their last name is Rubio, stuff like that. San Luis Potosí, if you're from there, it's most likely your, fam your family arrived because of mining. The church also handed out last names in Mexico. That's not exactly true. Like that's not, the church handed out first names. The church handed out first names. Like that's true. It's um, customary for, in Catholicism, to like baptize your kid, like in like the legit way to baptize your kid, not the way like people do it now where like you kind of wait till they're like 10. In the legit way, you're supposed to do it within like seven days of them being, being born. You have to do it like right away. And so the, the church used to hand out like first names like crazy. Here's Juan, here's Pablo, here's Pedro, here's this. and that. So like everybody got first names. Last names, that's kind of hit and miss. That didn't always happen. That was not a requirement. Like a lot of people don't really understand that. Like that was not a forced thing. And like that, that's kind of like for me, like I don't really have a political attachment to any of this stuff because a lot of times when I hear like, stuff like about like the colonial period like a lot of it's kind of like it er it originates from like a political kind of undertones or like just kind of like misconceptions and i mean there's totally lots of abuses during that time but like when i when i see stuff that's not exactly true like i just say it's not true because it's not um but uh but the, the, the first name thing for sure like they handed out first names like crazy but the last name thing that was kind of hit and miss and honestly you could you they allowed indigenous people to have indigenous words as last names and and like you can do genealogy and see that and i've seen tons of like there was a common last name in michoacan for purepecha is like tsipakwa you know and then there's like um i mean we have moctezuma right there's like people in like mexico that have last name moctezuma that's an indigenous word but what happens is is like indigenous people moved to the cities and they became urbanized and so because the spaniards you know, a lot, some of them had like, you know, these big, vast, like farmlands and stuff like that. But for the most part, like they were like city dwelling people. So, you know, they lived in these like very robust cities like Guadalajara. They lived in Monterrey. They lived in Mexico City. These were like robust urban centers. They had money, right? Well, some of them did. A lot of them were broke. But like, that's where the money was at generally, you know, just kind of industry started there. And so like people moved to the urban settings and they, they would just adopt last names. And that's just kind of what happened. And this is this is why, like, it's, it's important to study this stuff factually. And this is why I tell people do genealogy because you get these like really horrific things you hear, like we were all raped and like everybody's a product of that stuff. Like, yeah, that kind of stuff happened in war and stuff like that. But you like, to think that our entire country was founded on that stuff, that's just like, that's like p political propaganda. Not I'm not saying that like atrocities didn't happen, but Base your like yourself off of truth. And so that's why I say just do your genealogy. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to political hacks. You do that's why I put this stuff out there because no one can tell you who you are. Like you have to find that stuff on your own. And as Mexican people, there is no consensus on race, right? You could get like the lightest skinned guy out there, light skin, and like he totally thinks he's Aztec. And then you could see like the darkest skinned dude, and he totally thinks he's a Spaniard. So there's, there's no consensus on race. And like, and then here in this country, we kind of like adopt American ways of race and it's all warped and horrible. And so that's why I always tell people, do your genealogy. Just find what you're looking for. And then um, don't base your heritage off of some like horrific stuff that may not even be true for your family. Uh, yeah, exactly. There was also love. Exactly. Like you, you, I have like, I've never seen and like I, I, and I have done my genealogy for 10 years. Okay. 10 years, not one single parent, not one single parent. I'm not, not, not knocking single parents or anything like that. I have like single parents. I have cousins that are single parents. Not one though. I'm just saying like I have a birth record and a marriage record going back for like generations, like hundreds of years of like birth birth records and marriage records. So I'm just saying, it's not true for my family. So do your own research for yours. And I know, and I know that you're gonna do your genealogy and you are going to be like, you're going to find a lot of meaning in your life. That's why I'm just saying for you guys to just do your own research and um, you're gonna find some cool stuff. You're gonna find so many cool things. Like, 
what you're going to find, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find people that did extraordinary things. You're going to find people that did like sailed across the ocean. Uh, you're going to find people that like founded a new city. These are all things that I found. People that sailed across an ocean, people that founded a city, people that conquered a city, people that conquered, you know, entire provinces. You're going to find, you know, indigenous people in your family, like, like real indigenous people that like you finally find that. And it's like the, the greatest thing ever because it's like very liberating. You know, it's like we're always searching for our indigenous past. And then when you find that in your ancestry, it's very, it's very, um, it kind of makes you whole, I guess. How do you find these records? So go to my um, my page when you're done. And so look for like my genealogy series. If you go to my page and you look at the tutorials, you will find uh, like all the tutorials on how to do it. An indigenous language, unfortunately I don't. I really wish I did, but I don't. Uh, my, my opinion on Joaquin Murrieta, um, he has an interesting history. So Ancestry said you had 35% native, but there's no recollection of native heritage. Well, okay, this is another thing too. Okay, let's talk about native heritage right now. Uh, what percentage European are you? It's pretty high. It's pretty high. So, okay, let's talk about native heritage real quick. Okay, so there's a couple things. One is native heritage, even in pre-Hispanic times, native heritage was very tight. And this is more true in central Mexico. It's less true like in northern Mexico where people are very nomadic. But if your family's from like central Mexico or southern Mexico, um, ethnic identity was very much tied to your hometown. Okay. So if you were from a particular, t like, a, like think of like, um, and this is not exactly a one for one comparison, but if you think of like the Greek, the Greeks, they were like a bunch of city states, you know, it's kind of like there's Athens, there's Greece, there's like all these like cities there. And like each one has their own like little mini identity. And in, in Mexico, ethnic identity was very much tied to your hometown. So this is why I tell people, if you want to get close to your indigenous heritage, just study your hometown, okay? Study the heritage of it. Because like, um, for example, like if you're from Michoacan, there's really only one, well, there's a couple different ethnic groups in Michoacan, but the biggest one, and they have like 140,000 people that are part of this ethnic group, they are the Purépecha people. And I'm sure you've probably all heard of that. Um, and so even them, like their language is spoken like in like uh, mostly like the northern part of the state, but they're, they're very like iconic of being from Michoacan. But even back then, like people from Pátzcuaro were very much like their identity was very much linked to Pátzcuaro. If they were from Tzintzunzan, like their identity was very much linked to Tzintzunzan. There's other places, there's like the Meseta Purépecha, and like there's like these like 11 pueblos that are there. And so depending on where you're from in these places, like that's, that's where your ethnic heritage was very much tied. Yeah, you should do your genealogy if you want to find your indigenous heritage, because what you're going to find, and I was going to, I'm going to do a video on this too, because I get a lot of people talking about like indigenous, um, like how do you know what tribe you're from? A tribe is like very much like a European or like a modern concept. They ha there is like ethnic affiliation, but like ethnic affiliation has many layers to it, right? Ethnic affiliation in pre-Hispanic times could have been centered around particular like deities, you know, like people who are linked to certain practices like that. That's one layer of ethnic affiliation. It's not all, it's not the end all and be all, but it's one layer of ethnic affiliation. Then there's language, then there's region, then there's like you know, different like family, like family affiliations you, you were from. So it's like, there's many layers of, of like ethnic affiliation. And, and it's, it's hard to kind of grapple with that in our time. Like we have to like, remember that you're trying to answer a question that was like changed like 500 years ago. So maybe ethnic affiliation is different now because you know, people live in modern times, right? Like the Purépecha people, they're modern people and they have modern ways and they have their own traditional ways that they've blended with that on how to, you know, grapple with ethnic heritage. But if you're trying to find like a lost heritage, you may be looking for a sense of ethnic affiliation that may not exist in the present sense. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, are you find yourself to a particular town 
or you found yourself to a particular, you know, you might have found some sort of ethnic heritage, but you don't believe in that particular God anymore, right? Like there's different like deities that they had. You don't have the same like cosmovision, you know, like a worldview. So it's like, just remember, you're kind of looking for something. And I, and I know that that's kind of like hard to grapple with because I know so many of us want to get in touch with our ethnic heritage, like our ancestry, like our indigenous ancestry. But you do have to remember you are looking for a, a type of ethnic heritage that was lost that may not exist anymore. So, but how do you grapple with that? And how do you approach that? The way I, I would suggest, if you want to find ways to kind of reconcile finding your lost indigenous heritage and have some kind of meaning in the 21st century, is one, do your genealogy. And what you're gonna find on your genealogy, unfortunately, it's just gonna say Indio, okay? It's just gonna say Indio on the baptismal records and on the marriage records. You're going to find the word Indio. And remember, Indio is a colonial concept. So already you're hitting a brick wall with like authentic, authenticity. Because Indio itself, like the racialization of indigenous people by having them all collectively viewed as, as Indios, quote unquote, that's already like, something that people began to because it's kind of like you know people create latinx and like you know obviously that didn't go anywhere like that's going away but anyway people create these labels and then all of a sudden there's like an identity attached to it so it's like the word indio gets created and then all of a sudden like people start identifying with the word or it gets it gets forced on people and stuff like that and so already it becomes problematic just by finding indio it becomes like now you're dealing with something that's created during the colonial period but let's just say you find that and you're like, okay, well, at least I got that. I found my indigenous side, uh, Indio. And what city did you find it in? Did you find it in, you know, Zamora? Did you find it in Plaza Salca? Did you find it in Purepero? Did you find it in um, Merida in the Yucatan? Like, where did you find it in? Okay, so, okay, boom, you found the word. And I know, I know the word Indio, I know it's funny, but like that's, we're talking about colonial era terms because we're talking about genealogical documents. So I am sorry if like it offends people, like, but that's, that's just the colonial era word and we're talking about documents. So I'm going to use that word. So you find that word and you're like, okay, I found my heritage. I found that, that ancestor. Then you look at what city did you find it in? Okay. So at, at the very least, my ancestors had identified as indigenous in the the year 1800 and it's like okay and they identified as year as indigenous in the year 1800 in uh mexico city and you're like okay well chances are you're from like a nawa community and that's probably the closest you're gonna get now remember mexico city was like a multi-ethnic city so there's otomias there there's purepechas living there there's tlaxcalans living there so it's kind of hard you know all you can do is pin down okay here's the city and here's where I'm being labeled as, uh, or my ancestors being labeled as Indio. And then boom, just starts. And once you find those two things, just start studying the history of that town, because that's probably the closest you're going, you're going to get to where your like indigenous ancestry was lost. Yeah. I don't claim Latinx either. I never use that. I tell people, no, I just, yeah, I don't use that. 